The piscine has been a really challenging period to me, being a self-taught programmer who was starting basically from total zero. Here in this channel, I want to help you resolve all the problems that were given during this period, trying to understand them on a first principle basis. Personally, I won't explain you Vim, I won't explain you Bash, I won't explain you the C language itself. I mean, you need to understand for yourself what is an editor, in this case Vim, you need to understand what is a terminal and how it works, like Bash, which is a program that allows you to speak with your computer. And you need also to know the basic rules, so the basic syntax of the C language itself. Actually, there is no point on me making all this material, given all the richness that you can stumble upon online. There is plenty, indeed, of good resources already made available on YouTube, for example. So I will link in the description all the resources. If the words Vim, Bash and C doesn't tell you absolutely anything, if you're a total zero, you really need to learn them before starting to watch how exercises are made. So go in the description, check all the resources, and then see you later maybe. There is an important caveat though. You just have to learn the basics. You just have to understand superficially what is an editor, the commands, especially in Vim. You need to know Bash and what is a terminal, but not all the commands. You just need to learn the basics to start. And you need to know the basics of C in order to start to write your first programs. Don't waste too much time in paralysis analysis and the tutorial hell, like watching video after video, trying to learn as much as possible on a theory standpoint. It is not gonna be worth your time, believe me. Just grasp the basic concept and then come back and start to make exercises, one after the other. The exercises from the piscine of School 42 are really, really good because they respect the progressive overload stimuli, which is a very important concept, not only in the gym, but also in the intellectual endeavors. So you start from very simple exercises and then you go up the ladder, increasing every time the weights you put over your mind, right? So a really important point is that theory is embedded into code itself. Coding, being a programmer, is a practical work. This is a very important lesson that I've learned with a lot of time because I am a very analytical person who always tries to understand everything about a subject, but it is really impossible with programming and coding itself and computer science in general. So long story short, practice, practice, practice. Get the bare minimum principles and then start. Okay, I'm gonna start with the exercises before I just lay down a little frame in which I want you to practice the code. A frame that helped me, frankly, to understand all the exercises and how a computer works in general. So first and foremost, what is a computer? This is the most important question when you start coding and computer science in general, right? You need to understand the machine. A computer is a complex beast and pay attention to the word complex. The opposite of complex uh, is not simple. It is independent. Inside your computer, indeed, you have many parts which are interdependent one each other. Therefore, to understand uh, a complex entity is a good idea to decompose this thing and try to understand how the single components work together to give birth to the object itself, right? Let's try to understand this concept with a parallel with biology. We agree that a human organism is a very, very complex entity composed of many bits of many things that cooperate together. If I want to understand something into this chaotic system, a good way is to decompose this organism. How can I do that? Well, I can start from the very bottom of reality, from the very pixel of reality. Let's say it is a string from string theory. I can rise up level after level, arriving into the organism itself. So I have my string, then I have my atoms, then I have my molecules, then I have my proteins, then I have my organelles, then I have my cell, then I have my tissue, then I have my apparatus, and so forth. You get the point. At the last round of the ladder, I get the organism itself. Now the question, if I want to understand how an organism, how a person works, which level, in your opinion, should I start my investigation? Starting from strings, maybe it is not the best idea because we are at the lowest level of reality and it is going to be pretty messy starting from there. A better level maybe would be the one of the cells. With cells, I can understand how tissues are made, but maybe it's still too low, right? A good level, I would argue, is the level of organs, right? You have the stomach, you have the liver, you have the pancreas, which cover a specific function inside the organism. A better level would be probably the level of apparatus or systems. So I have in an organism the nervous system, I have the digestive system and so forth. So I have some functional blocks or some functional modules that provide a certain function, a certain utility, all together. These systems provide the organism itself. So we have from biology that we start from cells. We can consider cells the bits of an organism and we arrive at the lower end of the spectrum with an organism itself. If I want to understand how a computer works, I need the same approach, basically. 
The cells of a computer are the so-called logic gates. These logic gates link together to form chips. Chips link together to form organs, quote unquote. Organs link together to form the computer itself. So I have some blocks that produce a certain function that allows the system to be the system itself. So let's watch these two organs inside a computer. We have a CPU, which is the central processing unit. We can consider the CPU the brain of the computer. It is where all the calculations happen. Basically, you can think about a fancy calculator that is able to make uh, arithmetic and logic functions. I hope you know what logic operations are. The other really important organ is the memory, which is the random access memory or RAM. Here is where data is stocked, data in form of binary digits. You can think of a RAM as a series of boxes with a specific number, like the post boxes. You have a lot of them and you can stock inside these boxes all the data you want. A box contains eight light bulbs, so a box in our vision is a byte. A byte simply means a chunk, a byte indeed of data. So basically that's it. You can visualize mentally the computer as made as a fancy calculator and a memory. So you have a calculator that operates in the data stocked in this memory. That's it. Just keep this image in your mind. So in this slide, you can see the real chip, the real RAM, which is this chip that is highlighted. This photo, this slide doesn't tell me anything about the inner workings of this RAM, right? I don't know how it works, what it does and so forth. Useless, basically. Now, before I was telling you that the RAM is just a fancy series of boxes that contains some light bulbs. When I was making this assumption, I was making an abstraction, which is a pervasive concept in computer science. Abstraction is the art of producing models of reality which are simpler to grasp for our mind. For example, this RAM, for me, which is a silicon chip, is just a fancy series of light bulbs. Light bulbs which are transistors, of course, in the real world, but for me, they're just light bulbs that can be on or off. Basically, that's it. I don't really care about reality itself. I have my abstracted view of the memory. This abstracted view will help me to use it. You will see it later. So me, as a programmer, I can turn on or off these lamps. Basically, that's it. So now we have the concept of data type. What does it mean, really, data type? When I say char or int or short or float, what do I really mean? I told you that I have only some light bulbs in the memory that I can turn on or off. So when I say the computer, I want to stock some variable into memory, some random number. What do I really do? Well. I'm just telling the computer, go into the RAM, find the spot, and then turn on or off these light bulbs. This will mean something to me. For example, I want to read these light bulbs on and off like a char or like a short or like an int. So basically, the concept is this. We have two ways of stocking data inside the RAM, in an integer way or in a float way. There is a really big difference from the way a floating type is stocked in memory compared to int type. You should know this. I will leave you a link in the description because it is really, really important. So the simple take home message I want to give you is that when you declare a variable, you're just telling the computer, hey, I want a one byte, two byte, four byte, eight byte in memory. Inside that addresses, turn on or off the transistor or the light bulbs in this fashion. These light bulbs will mean something to me, will mean a binary number. You should know what is a binary number, of course, a link in the description of the explanation of binary numbers. And this binary number will mean something. Could be, it could mean a number, which is an, an integer or long, a short. So I can stock in my memory this stuff. Let's see a practical example. When I say int and b equal to 10, what I am really doing, I'm saying, hey, computer, just allocate four bytes of memory. As you saw before, an integer takes four bytes. And inside, put the number 10 in a binary form, which is 1010. Zero, zero. So what I do, I go turn on and off the light bulbs in that fashion. Very, very simple. The other declaration is char chi equal 96. So what do I do? I go in memory, one byte, because a char is one byte, and I put inside the number 96, which is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and so forth. So as a programmer, what do I do really? Well, I am changing the electrical state of the RAM, right? It is like writing code as a real physical effect on something real, uh, silicon chips inside the computer. I don't know about you, but I think this is kind of remarkable, right? Some dead characters are able to change reality, physical reality. Very cool. One important take home message here is that the uh, char, which is a character, is simply a number, right, inside our RAM. Or better, it is simply a state, an electrical state. So you can consider a char simply as a one byte number, right? There is no basically different. Uh, you will see this when we are gonna write our codes. So to make it short, a computer is a calculator, an arithmetic logic calculator, 
that is able to modify the states of a memory, which is the RAM. Memory is just a series of bytes, a series of boxes which have a specific address. Inside, inside these boxes, I can put all the binary digits that I want. And these digits will mean something that I decide as a programmer. So when I write a program, I'm just giving some data that is gonna be put into the memory. This data is gonna be processed by the central processing unit, especially by the HALU arithmetic logic unit, which is a fancy calculator, which makes very simple calculations. This data get processed and then it is put back into memory. Changing the state of the memory, it is gonna change the output of something like the display, for example. I just want you to keep in mind this image, this mental model to understand better the programs. This is a really important frame of thought for me. This has been really important to just perceive the computer as a calculator and some RAM and some electrical state that conveys meaning to me. So as a programmer, we have the superpower to change the state of memory through our algorithms, which are a fancy way of saying a series of calculation that gives us a, re a result. So this is only an introductory video. I'm gonna continue with the exercise themselves, which are the meat, the really important part.